this, and if you have your Bible, I almost said your bulletin, my Lord. If you have your Bible, um, open it to the passage that uh, Elder Lockhart led us in the reading and hearing of Matthew 21, 18 through 22, forms the contextual environment from whence the text comes. We'll read verses 18 and 19. They should now be on the screen behind me. Would you read it aloud with your pastor online? Join me in doing the same thing. Now, verse 18, we begin. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately, the fig tree withered away. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Beloved, we come today, this Sunday morning, in this journey to the resurrection. Doug, I'm so glad to see you. And uh, we come to what is commonly known among us in the uh, modern Christian church as Holy Week. Now, of course, this is not Holy Week, but we are in a um, seven-week series uh, that is looking individually at every day of Holy Week, beginning with Palm Sunday, and of course, Reverend Nan ending on Resurrection Sunday. Now, now Deacon Gloria, let's, let me just say this. I, I am aware, I am cognizant of the fact that I have thrown several of you into a serious state of discombobulation. I know, I know some of y'all have been scratching your head uh, and trying to figure out, first of all, what in the world is Pastor doing up here starting in February, now in March, uh, looking uh, at Holy Week? Why is he up there first Sunday in March talking about Holy Week and one of the days? I know, I know, I know you, you come to church for regularity and for consistency. And I know that I have thrown, uh, how shall I say it, my Mary, I have thrown a biblical theological monkey wrench into your liturgical year. But, but I think I tried my best to explain to you on last Sunday why I and others of my sons and daughters, brothers and sisters in Berean are preaching our way uh, through Holy Week. Because as I said last Sunday, uh, we live in a world, I will not stay on this long, we live in a world that is not only biblically inaccurate, in many ways, it is biblically illiterate. Uh, those who think they know the word uh, very often are inaccurate about what they think Lee, they know about the word. And then, Mike, those who, who know the word and are inaccurate are accompanied by maybe an even larger group of folk. And those are they who are biblically illiterate. Now, now, now saying that Deacon Snell uh, bothers me to no end because I grew up in a day and time when the Bible was central to our lives and to our being. Uh, all of us, all of us, uh, Deacon Skelton, all of us grew up in a home and, and you had, you. okay, here it is, I'm going to show how old I am. You had several things in the house. You had a cookbook. I know y'all ain't got none of them in your house. You got a cook, you had a cookbook. You had a set of encyclopedias. <laughs> World book or whatever it was. And you had a Bible. Mostly in the living room on a coffee table. 
Are y'all in the room with me? And I tell you, it was a, you could almost get a hernia picking it up. Because my God, Deacon Sylvia, it was as big as all outdoors. <laughs> And that Bible, stay with me now, in the living room, on the coffee table. You got to picture it now. In the living room, on the coffee table, in the center of the living room, which was the center of the house, marked and said, the word is at the center of who we are as a family. We, we've lost that. We've lost that. My God, now at the center of our family are flat screen televisions. Y'all getting quiet on me. And my God, the filth they bring into our houses. The profanity and the vulgarity and the promiscuity. Why is it when I preach like this, it gets quieter and quieter the longer I preach? We, we have put upon the walls of our house, almost from wall to wall, we put up these large, massive, flat screen television, surround sound. And it lets everything and anything into our homes. We move the Bible and we put HBO Cinemax. Y'all getting quiet on me. And all this other stuff at the center of our lives. The church and the pulpit have to declare it's time to bring the word back. I'm trying to get help here. Bill, I don't know where to look. And, and, and one of the ways we do that is by focusing ourselves on those great, not only doctrines, teachings of the word of God, but on, here it is Uncle George, on those great days of the Christian calendar. And so I, I'm asking you to join me on a journey. I know you're discombobulated. I know I done messed you up. You don't know whether to wear your Easter clothes next Sunday or not, because I don't know what to do. I don't know what to wear. Because he up there preaching about Holy Week in February and early March. But I want us to understand what Christ did for us. What it cost him to save us. And how when he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, I told you last week, he, he entered the point of no return. So today, today, uh, this Sunday, we are, we are walking our way around Tuesday of Holy Week. Sunday, Jesus comes to church, to the, to the city. Monday, he goes to the church and cleans out the church. Uh, when he gets through cleaning out the church, because they've turned it into a flea market, text says he leaves and goes back to where he's staying and then the text today and the next morning he heads back to the city now what's interesting is on his way back through the city I don't know why obviously Starbucks wasn't open Panera wasn't open Wendy's wasn't open so he he's hungry isn't that what the text says? Yes. And he sees a fig tree. And he expects to find fruit. I'm going to come back to that. Finding none, he curses that tree. And says, let, let no fruit ever grow on you again. And immediately the fig tree with it. Stop right there. Have you noticed... Uh, the Jesus of Monday and Tuesday is a, Mother Sharon, he's a rather different Jesus than y'all been peddling. I don't, Deacon, Deacon, Deacon William, I don't, I don't, I don't, Kondorkis, I don't really recognize the Jesus of Monday and Tuesday. 
Jesus going in church, knocking over tables, chasing out money. And now Tuesday, because you would think, well, he was having a bad day. He was tired from that march and that parade on Sunday. We're going to give him Monday because that's why they call it Blue Monday. You think that he had a good night's sleep Monday night and he'd be in a better attitude on Tuesday. <laughs> and bless God. He's hungry. Maybe that's the problem. He's hungry. <laughs> and he goes to that tree. And he doesn't find anything on it but leaves. And he curses that tree. That, that is such, that is such, uh, Deacon's Murdoch, that's such a different Jesus than you and I are used to. We, we are used to a gentle Jesus, meek and mild. What do you do with a Jesus that gets angry? Are y'all ready for me today? And the reason why I'm bringing that up, reason why I'm bringing that up is because I think we have to reclaim and rescue Jesus from historical biographical revisionists who would remake him into something and someone that is no threat to them. God, I'm preaching real good. It, it, it's, what, it's what people have done and I don't just mean white. Black folk have done it too. It's what we've done to Dr. King. We have made Dr. King so docile. We made Dr. King so passive. We made him so non-violent that we have robbed Dr. King of the genius and the courage and the brilliance of who he really was because we like a, a king that dreams but not not a king that speaks truth to power about the Vietnam War. Y'all ain't helping me. Y'all ain't helping me. And we like a Jesus that plays with the children and feeds the hungry and heals the sick and, and gives a sermon on the mount. But we don't like a Jesus who messes up churches and curses trees. Reason why, I, I'm, I'm pretty near through. The reason why we don't like him is because we can deal with anger in Jesus because we don't always know how to deal with anger in us. Okay, I'm going to leave that alone, leave that alone. That, 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 and and I, I'm talking now about Christians that we don't really know how to, Nicole, how to handle our emotions. And, and then we, you know, those of us over here in holiness, you know, we got taught when you got saved and got sanctified, all that stuff got pulled up by the root. So we walking around thinking that because I'm saved, I don't never get angry. I don't ever have a day when something gets on my nerve. And so you're walking around, you men perpetrating a fraud about to die with a stroke and ulcers because you don't know how to express the humanity that is in you. Tap a neighbor, say, I'm saved, but I'm human. I'm human. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this, Derek. I'm going to say this. I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to say it. But listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus was fully human. If not, he couldn't save us. And so, and so, and so, Monday and Tuesday, it's amazing to me, Tracy, Monday and Tuesday, we got Jesus with these outbursts. And, and part of the reason why we're struggling is because we have drawn a line of demarcation. We have created an unnecessary, let me stop that for my watch go off. We have created an unnecessary dichotomy between being human and saved and being godly and having emotions. Or watch this, to think that to be meek is to be weak. I, uh, is Mary here today? Is Sister Mary? Thomas here today, she was here last week. Her late husband, who was a member of our church until he went home to be with the Lord, uh, the late brother Jefferson Thomas. Uh, Jeff, some of y'all remember, uh, was a member of the Little Rock Nine. 
1957, what, 1957, Little Rock, Arkansas, um, those nine young people sought to enroll at Little Rock Central High School. And uh, they were met both by their, I think Orville Forbes was the governor of Arkansas. Um, uh, nobody called his name but me. See that? Nobody know his name. <laughs> Fought them. Militant crowds spat on them. Hurled at them. Vile, vulgar language day after day after day because they just wanted to go to school. I'm going to say this if y'all run me out of here. And, and, and what's said is the overwhelming majority of those folks claim to be Christians. Spat on them and taunted them and jeered them and made their life. And it was, it was not until uh, Dwight Eisenhower the 34th president of the United States had been a general in the army in the Second World War. You remember D-Day. And then went on to become president of Columbia University where our mother worked for many, many years. He, he sent uh, federal troops in the Little Rock to ensure those kids could go to school. What, 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 what amazed me is it looked like the crowd had strength. And those young, those nine young people had none. And yet history remembers the name of the Little Rock Nine and not near name or any of those rabbit racists who saw, because watch this, sometimes strength is not in fighting back, but strength is standing your ground and letting God fight your battle. I feel like preaching up in here today. I think of James Meredith who was shot trying to enter uh, into Ole Miss. Looked like all the powers of Mississippi arrayed against him. But thanks be to God that truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future. And behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. The arc of the universe is long, but thank God it been toward justice huh. it was it was it was Medgar Evers it was James Meredith it was a little rock now James Lewis bloody Sunday John Lewis bloody Sunday <sighs> beaten to a pulp a white woman Viola Luzzi who uh, was shot because she had the audacity and, and had the nerve to transport white civil rights workers back to boarding houses, shot and killed. A white woman from Detroit. What you doing in Alabama from Detroit? Because right doesn't know color. Okay, y'all ain't gonna help me. Y'all stop making civil rights movement just black folk. There were white people who helped us and stood with us because right doesn't know color. I, I bring that up. I bring that up because in seeing Jesus act like he acted Monday and Tuesday, you almost want to wonder now, is Jesus saved? Because <laughs> we don't think saved folk act like that. But beloved, Jesus didn't just say Jesus is the Savior. Come on, Lee, and he teaches us how to handle those things in life that don't honor God. And that's why I'm going to cross, come cross field now, Lee. That is why on Tuesday, he curses that fig tree. Here's why. Stay with me. I'm going to leave it alone. Here's why. Remember the text says he's hungry and he sees leaves on the tree and he goes to it. Expecting to find fruit, finds none, and he curses the tree. How unfair is that? Here, it's not unfair at all. Because if you were any way informed about the nature of horticulture as it relates to fig trees, you would know 
that fig trees always sprout leaves after they sprout fruit. Or they simultaneously sprout leaves and fruit. So the presence of the leaves represents the reality of the existence of fruit. Because there shouldn't be leaves unless there's fruit. Y'all ain't helping me. So Jesus is not expecting the tree to be something it couldn't be. It is merely telling the tree, if you don't have it, don't say it. Okay, 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 y'all ain't, Lee, they ain't got it yet, so I got to go for the juggler. It, it, it's what, it's what um, D- Deacon Snell's late pastor, the Reverend Dr. Sandy Frederick Ray, used to say when he preached this day. He said, when Jesus looked at that tree with nothing but leaves on it, knowing that if there were leaves, there ought to be fruit. He wasn't just thinking about that tree. He was thinking about that church he was at the day before that looked just like that tree tree it looked good but it didn't have nothing I'm through I know y'all ain't gonna like me the rest of the sermon but I just wonder if Jesus came by 3480 today all of us sitting up in here like dirty clothes in a hamper would we look like a fig tree that has a bunch of leaves but there's no fruit on us because we look the part but we don't have what we look like Can I preach in my own pulpit today? Would you tap a neighbor, say, neighbor, is there more to you than leaves? Is there more to First Church than just our building? Is there more to First Church than just the bodies that occupy our sanctuary and join us online? Is there more to First Church than just our budget? Is there more to us than just leaves? Because seeing leaves, he expects fruit. Because in the world of horticulture and agriculture, agronomy, Fig trees produce fruit, then leaves. Or leaves and fruit simultaneously. But anytime you see leaves on a fig tree, you have every right to believe there's some fruit up under there. I wonder if somebody came to First Church today and started lifting the leaves. Would they find any fruit? Bill said to me yesterday while he was cutting my hair that somebody said to him, what was wrong with your pastor last week? He seemed so angry. Who upset him? (laughs) I thought about what I preached. I I wasn't angry. I said, that wasn't an angry sermon. I was just feeling passionate. (laughs) Sort of like I feel right now. But I think we've got, it's my job. Um, I've been, I, 41 years, y'all, we got to get it right. I, I don't have 41 more. No, Mom, Mary, I, I'm, I'm up against the clock. And my God, I don't want to spend 45, 46 years here and we know better, only bigger. Because bigger doesn't always mean better. So what happens in the text? I'm glad you asked. I have 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes on it. Take me back, uh, team, to 10 minutes. I asked for 30 because I knew I was going to need five extra. So take me back to, to 10 minutes. Here's the first thing. In this text today, we have an indictment from Jesus of a dead religion. 
Now let me say this. I need to say this, Pastor Kelly. Th that this point, the message is not to demonize any religion, especially uh, those who belong to the Jewish faith, our brothers and sisters who, be who belong to the Jewish faith. I am not demonizing them. I am not criticizing or castigating them. But, but this message is intended to warn and remind us is that this is what can happen to any church, any denomination, or any Christian who isn't in a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ that has you growing every day. If we're not careful, Debbie, we can become a dead church. We can become a dead Christian. A denomination can become a dead denomination. Now remember, I told you what Dr. Ray said. Commentators over the years have said that this tree represented not only the temple, but the whole religious life of that day. In so many ways, the religious life, now there wasn't any other denomination, you know, that's what I'm saying. You know, I'm not beating up on the, our Jewish brothers and sisters, but in the day of Jesus, there wasn't no Presbyterians, there weren't any Baptists or Methodists, they were just Jews. That was the only, not Christian religion, but Jehovahistic religion. And there were other false religions. But there, there were no other denominations like there are now. And so when Jesus, scholars say, Dr. Ray and scholars say, and when Jesus cursed that fig tree, he wasn't just cursing that temple. He was cursing the whole religious life of his day because it represented dead religion. And beloved, that can happen to you and I individually as well as it can happen to the church collectively. We can have a form of godliness but deny the power. We got we to gotta watch, and I'm, I'm pretty near through, we got to watch dead religion. And we have to ask God to give us a living religion. Now, now, somebody says, well, well, pastor, what is a living religion? I'm glad you asked. James chapter 1, verses 26 through 27 says this. I love how James says, if anybody among you thinks he's religious. Oh, Jesus, anybody among you, don't look to your left or your right, look straight at me. Anybody sitting next to you think they religious and does not bridle his tongue but, dece but deceives their own heart, that person's religion is useless. Pure, undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, his real living religion, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Okay, y'all getting quiet. That's real religion. James says real religion, A, B, C, three things. A, it tempers, which means mastery. You got real religion, you ought to be able to have mastery over yourself. James says you can't keep your mouth shut. You don't have good, have you got good religion? Certainly, certainly. Ten of y'all knew it. You got good religion? Then it ought to temper you. You ought to have some self-control. Or oh, got real quiet. Then it touches people. Notice what he said. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Real religion causes you to touch people with the hand of God and the love of God. Boy, it's getting real quiet up in here. If I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living is not in vain. Real religion tempers. Real religion touches. And then here's C, write this down. And real religion transforms. Keep oneself unspotted from the world. You ought to be a change in our lives if we got good religion. 
I want to ask you today, everybody in this room, everybody online, how good is your religion? Is it, it, does it temper you at all? Or are you still flying off the handle? Confession time, Smitty. Pug, Pug and I, and little lady, all three of us were in um, Walmart last night looking for something for Pug for a project. I didn't know where it was. And uh, so I asked the gentleman, he was a foreigner working at, um, like he's from India, Pakistan or somewhere. And I asked him where it was and he said something and I didn't think he was right. And I just, <clears throat> and walked away. Y'all leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. So uh, I went where he said, and uh, I couldn't find it there. I was really getting frustrated then, and I looked, and I, it was up against the wall, and we found it. And so we walked. I said, Pug, I said, where was that man? And he said, Grandpa, I don't know where he was. I said, I think he was over here. And so I he kept on, Grandpa, I said, is that him? He said, no, Grandpa, that's not him. And so <laughs> I kept walking, kept on searching until I found him. And I found him and I said, sir, I said, I wanted to say thank you for telling, I, I didn't say thank you when you told me. <laughs> I just walked away in a huff. And he broke out in the biggest smile. I said, thank you, he says, oh. <laughs> then he said something else, I don't know what he said. <laughs> but he seemed happy about it. Does it temper you? Does it, does it touch anybody? Does it transform you? Here's, here's a second. In the text and in the encounter of Jesus with that tree, we also see Uncle George, Deacon George R. Mary Sr., the indication of a new kind of religion. In essence, in verse 21, y'all ready for this? Fasten your seatbelt. They, they are shocked that the fig tree withers so quickly. And Jesus turns to them and says the strangest thing. Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but you can say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. It will be done. Y'all ain't ready. You know what Jesus just said? You can do the same thing. God, I wish I had about 145 people who could just, okay, I'll take 100 online who just get excited that Jesus just told you, you don't have to settle for a dead religion. I, I've indicted the dead religion, but I want to give you an indication of the kind of religion you can have, the kind of life you can live. You're shocked that I told a tree, an inanimate object, nothing ever grow on you again and immediately it withers you're shocked by that what I need to tell you you can do the same thing God help me here and I wish Patty I wish we had some saints in the house and some saints online who believe for once in your life that Jesus is able by the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life to give you the power to do greater than you've ever done before somebody holler I can do the same thing I have the power in me it's an indication, Sister Smith. It's an indication, Smitty, of a new kind of religion. Oh, God, I thank you. It's a new kind of religion. Religion of that day had three components. Here it is, A, B, and C. It had, it had a place. That was the temple. It had a person that was the priest. And then see, it had a people. Those would be the Jews. That was the end of religion in that day. A place, the temple. A person, the priest. And then a people, the Jews. But Jesus flips the script. So I'm going to give y'all an indication of coming attractions. Y'all don't see it. Acts 1 and 8. <laughs> Remember Acts chapter 1? Jesus getting ready to go back to heaven. And, and the disciples asked, are you going to restore uh, at that time uh, Jerusalem and Israel to its place of prominence? And Jesus says, that's none of your business. 
It's not for you to know the times or the seasons that belong to the purview of the Father, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And then, Lee, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost, y'all didn't see it, to the uttermost parts of the world. He flips the script. He says, now all before it was a place, the temple. All before it was a person, the priest. All before it was a people, the Jews. But when the Holy Ghost comes, when Pentecost hit, when the beginning of a new day begins to commence on that day it won't just be in the temple it won't just be the priest it won't just be the Jews but Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the world y'all still ain't got it it's not your fault it's mine I'm tired I'm not preaching it like y'all need me to but here's what I'm trying to tell you that in these last days it isn't about 3480 child I gotta get to church. God, I got to get to bishop. God, I got to get in the sanctuary. Listen, if you know who you are, you can have church anywhere. The Holy Ghost can move anywhere. And you don't need me there for a move of the Holy Ghost. And he'll fall on your sons and your daughters, on Jews and on Gentiles. Somebody holler, it's a new religion. It's a new religion. It's a new religion. All religion was a place and a person and a people. But Acts 1 and 8 says it's falling on everybody. As many as the Lord our God shall call, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Old folk and young folk. Jews and Gentile. I wish I had help up here. That's why on Pentecost they were there from Pontus and Cappadocia and Phygeria and they were there from Egypt and they were there from Africa and they were there from Crete and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia because in this new day I feel like preaching this God's getting ready to do a new thing. Would you look at a neighbor hollering new day new thing now tell another neighbor new day new thing and I'm so glad that whatever God is doing in this season if I make myself available he'll let me be a part of it oh, I gotta go I got two minutes and I'm over time here it is everybody say it's an indictment of a dead religion. It's an indication of a new religion. But then this encounter of Jesus with the fig tree, Daryl, was an invitation to what religion could and should be. Look at verse 22. If you have faith, he says, in verses uh, 21, surely I say to you, if you have faith, do not doubt you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but you can also say that the mountain be removed, be cast in the sea, it'll be done. That's an indication. And then he get issues, I love this invitation. And whatever things you ask in prayer, whoo, I don't know why y'all still sitting down. Whatever you ask in prayer, it shall be given to you. It's what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7 through 11, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find not, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Why y'all still sitting down? And he or she who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. Here's why. What man is there among you? If their child asks for a slice of bread, would give him a rock or a stone? Or if he asks for fish, would give him a serpent or a dangerous snake? And if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. I feel like preaching this. How much more? <laughs> oh, I want to shout right there. How much more? Can I say it one more time? How much more will your father who is in heaven give, give good gifts to those who ask him? Would you tell a neighbor, say neighbor, I haven't been invited to the White House. 
I haven't been invited to the state house. I haven't been invited to city hall. Come to think of it, I ain't even been invited to pastor's house. But I'm so glad I've got an invitation to the father's house. Come unto me, all ye that labor and a heavy burden I'll give you rest take my yoke upon you learn of me for my yoke is easy my burden is light all right Winston I think I feel like I got a little bit of strength to work just a little bit before I serve the supper is there anybody here who knows that our God is a consuming fire and our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. No matter how hard goes the battle of life, God's children need never despair. His comforting grace gives peace mid the strife. There's wonderful power in prayer. Wonderful. I need all saints now. Power in prayer. It moves the arm that moves the world. There's wonderful power in prayer. Would you tell a neighbor, neighbor? I told you before, prayer works because I've seen him do it. And Jesus invites us to join him in a new kind of religion that's based on, predicated on, buttressed by prayer so that A, I have the expectation of answered prayer. And my expectation of answered prayer is based on my prior experience of answered prayer. He's answered before, and I know he's able to do it again. So I have the expectation of a prayer hearing, prayer answering God. And my expectation is based on a previous prior experience because I prayed before and he made a way out of no way. I prayed before and he met my need. I prayed before and he healed my body. I prayed before and he saved my children. I prayed before and he met my need. I have an experience with prayer and my experience with prayer has heightened my expectation. But good morning, y'all. We got to head to the table, but can I close when I tell you that my expectation of answered prayer based on my experience of answered prayer fills my little life with an excitement about prayer that every time I get a chance to pray I get excited because it is no secret oh shucks what God can do what he's done for others he'll do the same for you with arms wide open he'll welcome you it is no secret what God can do come here grandma Help me close this sermon. You never got to hear me preach. You died before I answered the call, but you knew it was on me from a little boy. You always told me that God had his hand on me, and you left him before you ever heard me preach. But could you help me close this sermon today? And my grandma said, you ought to have a little talk with Jesus. She didn't know Hebrew, and she didn't know Greek. She didn't know exegesis or eisegesis. She didn't know hermeneutics, and Grandma didn't know homiletics, but she knew Yahshua Hamashiach, and she said, you ought to have a little talk with Jesus. You ought to tell him all about your trouble. He will hear your famous cry. He'll answer. By and by, 
when you feel a little friend will turn in, then you know got a little fire burning and just thank you grandma go on back to rest I'll close it myself and just a little talk with Jesus makes it all right do I have anybody here that had a little talk with him can I ask you one question did he make it all right did he fix it for you did he make a way for you did he lift up your bowed down head did he give you strength for the journey did he watch over you all night if he did it go ahead throw back your head and holler i had a little talk with jesus and he made it 